all its precepts I will obey. The Bible stands every test we give it, for its author is divine. By grace a lot I expect to give it, and to prove it and make it mine. The Bible stands stand when the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the Bible stands. Yes, the Bible stands. So I want you all to know that I, I respect your time. I know you just say it. I know some of you have some studies to do, and I respect your time, okay? And so I want to welcome everybody back to the Revelation of Jesus Christ seminar. Today's message I've entitled, The Unchangeable Law. And before we get into the message, I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads and pray with me. Um, Father, again, as we, as we look at your word, Father, we want to pray once again, Lord, for the spirit of truth to be upon us. Pray that you would send light to us, Father, to enlighten our minds to the battle that's taking place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So I remember when I was young, growing up, I used to watch um, war movies, and I remember watching these war movies in like World War I, World War II, and people would be getting drafted into the army, and I thought, man, that'd be, that would be scary, getting drafted into a war, not realizing, friends, that if you think about it, each one of us have been enlisted in an army. There is a war taking place today, an unseen war taking place, friends, and each one of us have been drafted into this army, friends, and this war taking place, an unseen war with unseen forces fighting against us, friends, and we want to look at this war today, friends. If you look at Revelations 12, verse 17, the Bible says that, and the dragon, who is the devil, was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So we see here, friends, there is a war being waged against God and against God's commandment-keeping people. Do you see that, friends? There is a war taking place, friends. God, the devil is attacking God, and he's attacking God's commandment-keeping people, friends. And there's a story in the Bible in Daniel chapter 6 that illustrates this war very, very, very nicely, friends. And it's a story of Daniel um, whenever the Medo-Persian Empire had conquered Babylon, the Medo-Persians killed all of the Babylonian officials, except for one, who was Daniel. And they saw that Daniel had a most excellent spirit, so he thought to make him ruler over all the providence of the Medo-Persian Empire. And there was one problem with that, though, friends, is that the governors and the princes and all the other um, officials of the Medo-Persian Empire did not like the thought of a Babylonian, of a Hebrew slave, because that's what he originally was, being set ruler over them. And so these people got together and they decided that they had started spying out Daniel. They sent people to watch him, try to find some type of occasion in Daniel. But they saw there was no, no finding an occasion in Daniel. There was nothing wrong with Daniel. Daniel was faithful to his God and they saw the only way that we are gonna get him is if we attack him concerning his law. And you know, this story right here, friends, is written in the Bible to show us what's going to take place in the end times. It is a parallel to the future. And we see this war taking place, friends, against God and his God's commandment-keeping people. And we see it in this story in Daniel, friends. So the people got together and they saw that they had to attack Daniel concerning God's law. So they passed, they went to the king, and they came up with a plan. They, they asked the king to sign this law saying that you could not pray to any God except for him for 30 days. An attack against God's Ten Commandment law right there. And so Darius signed the law, and as soon as, they, as soon as Daniel learned that the law was placed, the Bible says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and, in, and, and his window being open, in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed. And gave thanks before his God as he did before times. 
So just as they thought, friends, they caught Daniel, obeying God, but disobeying the king's law. They saw Daniel obeying God's Ten Commandment law, but disobeying the king's law. And the king saw that he had been set up here too, friends. When you read the story, when Darius had realized that he had been tricked, it says he labored until the going down of sun to try to release Daniel, but he couldn't because the law had been passed, friends. And so the Bible says, so the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God in whom you serve continually will deliver you. So Daniel went to the lion's den, friends. Daniel was willing to die rather than disobey God. Daniel knew the commandment said, thou shalt have no other God before me. And he was willing to make a stand and he was willing to die, friends. And when you read the story, you see that because he was willing to die, that God sent an angel and shut the mouths of those lions, friends. And you know, this same war, friends, that has been going on for a long time ago, years and years, is still taking place today, friends. The devil hates God's commandments, and he hates those who obey his commandments, friends. And God wants us to understand truth today. He wants us to know about his commandments. He wants us to be wise soldiers enlisted in this army, friends. That's what you are. Did you know that? You are soldiers in an army in a war. And God wants us to be wise and grounded in truth today, friends. So the first question I have is, can God's law, moral law, be amended or repealed? Can it be changed? I think the story we just read, friends, illustrates that God's law cannot be changed. If God's law could be changed, then Daniel wouldn't have to go to the lion's den. Daniel could have just obeyed the law of the land. But what does the Bible say, friends? It says, all his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever. God's law is not changeable, friends. You know, God came down on Mount Sinai in Exodus and took his finger and etched his law in stone. I want you to think about that for a moment. You know, the only part of the Bible that man did not write is God's law, his Ten Commandment law. He would not allow man to have anything to do with writing his law. He came down from heaven himself and etched it in stone with his own finger. Why do you think he did that? So that we would know that his commandments are forever and ever, everlasting, never to be changed, engraved on stone. The Bible says, for I am the Lord, I change not. God wants us to be wise and understand the war that's taking place in the world today, friends. Question number two is, according to the Bible, what is sin? What is sin? The Bible tells us. You know, I love, I love the Bible because it's so simple to understand. Even a child could understand the Bible. I love simple, I love simplicity. I'm a simple guy. And the Bible says sin is the what? The transgression of the law. So the sin is breaking God's law. The Bible says, I had not known sin, but by the law, I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. You know, the Ten Commandments are a broad, broad law, friends. You know, Jesus came to magnify the law. You know, when the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery, Jesus said to look after a woman and lust in your heart is breaking the law. When it says, thou shalt not kill, the Bible doesn't just mean simply doing the act of killing. Jesus says to hate your brother in your heart is committing the act of murder. You know, the Bible says that by the law is the knowledge of sin. I want you to think about that for a minute. How would we know about our condition? How would we understand our sinful condition? Was it not for God's law? God's law is meant to open up our eyes so that we can see our condition and so that we can flee to Jesus. God's law is a blessing to us. Those struggling with adultery, those struggling with hating people, how would they know their condition? Was it not for the law? They wouldn't. God's law is meant to be a blessing to us. Praise God for his law. Friends, you know, breaking God's law is the reason for all the crime, all the sadness, all, everything wrong with our world today. Friends, I want to show you this statistic right here. Every hundred hours, more youths die in the street than were killed in the Persian Gulf War. That's amazing. 
All those deaths, friends, all because people are making God's law void, breaking God's law because of sin. Because, of, you know, I've witnessed in my own life, too. You know, when I was 17 years old, my best friend died from a drug overdose because of sin, from breaking God's law. You know, I could tell you story after story. 26 years old, my best friend again was murdered on the streets of Tulsa, Oklahoma, dead. He was 26 years old. And that's just two people. Friends, I have witnessed with my own eyes what sin does, breaking God's law. God has blessed us with his law, friends, and he wants us to understand his law. God's law is a law of love, friends, and it is meant to show us our condition. God's law is meant to help us to open up our eyes to see our condition, friends. We need to praise God for his law. Next question, did Jesus keep the commandments? What do you think? Did Jesus keep the commandments? The Bible says, I have kept my father's commandments. Jesus was a commandment keeper. Jesus believed in the law. It was Jesus that came down on Mount Sinai and gave that law, friends, that law of love, the law that blesses us, the law that brings life, the law that is not to bring death, friends. The law is to open our eyes, friends. How many people have sinned? How many people have sinned? We heard this earlier, friends. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God of God. All have sinned, friends. Some say the Ten Commandments are not binding for New Testament Christians, but what does Jesus say? Have you ever heard that before? I know I did. We don't have to keep the commandments anymore, but what does Jesus say? Jesus says, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the what? Keep the commandments. You know, it's interesting. Every time that somebody asked Jesus, what can I do to inherit eternal life? You know what Jesus said every time? Keep the commandments. You know the law. There was one time somebody asked him, which ones? And Jesus began listing off the 10 commandments, friends. Jesus said, if you want eternal life, keep my commandments. Simple as that. Simplicity, isn't it? The Bible's simple, friends, and I praise God for it. Jesus says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus says, if it even enters into your mind that I've come to destroy the law, he says, don't even think it. He says, do not even think it. He has not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus keeps on saying, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. I have a question for you, friends. Is heaven and earth still here? Heaven and earth is still here, isn't it? Jesus says, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot nor one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, friends. So God's law is still binding today, friends. You know, we live in a world where they say God's law doesn't matter anymore. We can't keep God's law. We're under grace. We live by faith. You know, and the Bible is very clear, friends. Jesus says, don't even think it. Don't even think it for one moment. Jesus says, whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments. And there isn't a commandment that's least, friends. Jesus is saying, whichever one you think is least, you can pick out all ten. And whichever one you think is least, and which one of these you want to break, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Let me tell you something. That's not saying you're going to be in heaven. That's saying that those that are in heaven will look down upon those that are breaking the least of those commandments, and they will consider them least. Does that make sense? Because you're not going to get into heaven, friends, breaking God's law. But whosoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. God is seeking for people to obey him, friends, to keep his commandments. Jesus says, blessed are they that do his commandments. Blessed are they that do his commandments. But another question is, are some of the Old Testament laws no longer binding upon Christians? You know, I used to go to a church one time, and they said that the Ten Commandment law was nailed to the cross, that we don't have to obey the Ten Commandment law anymore. You know, I went and looked at the scriptures where they say the law is nailed to the cross, and I was amazed at what I saw, because there was a law nailed to the cross. The Bible says in Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances 
that was against us, that was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So was something nailed to the cross? There was something nailed to the cross. But notice what it says. I want you to notice the, what, the, notice the wording here, friends. It says what? Blotting out the what? I have a question, friends. What was the Ten Commandment written? What was the Ten Commandment law written, on, written with? The finger of God. It was not written in handwriting, first of all. It was written with the finger of God. So this law right here was written in handwriting, and it was ordinances which was contrary to us. I have a question for you. Was God's Ten Commandment law contrary to us? Was it against us? No. No, but when you study this out, friends, it makes so much sense. And you have to go to Deuteronomy to find the answer. Deuteronomy 31, verse 26. After Moses had wrote a book, not the Ten Commandments, Moses said, take this book of the law, the law of Moses, and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant, of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against thee. So God had the Ten Commandment law, and it was in the Ark, right? The two tables of stone. And Moses told the Levites to put this book beside the Ark, that it might be there as a witness against the people. So what, na- what, what law was nailed to the cross? Moses' law, it's very clear. Right here it tells us, this book, the law of Moses, was nailed to the cross. Not God's Ten Commandment law, friends. Not God's law at all. Next question is, how is it possible to keep the commandments? How is it possible to keep the commandments? You know, we see all these scriptures where where we're told to keep the commandments and to obey God. But if you're like me, you found yourself struggling sometimes to do that. Have you? Am I alone? I don't think I am. I don't think I am at all. But I want you to notice this right here, friend. This is the most important part of this whole sermon right here. Is how is it possible to keep the commandments of God? Look what the Bible says in Romans 8, verse 3. God, sending his own Son, condemning sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. This scripture right here says, because God had sent his son, condemned sin in the flesh. That means right now, here and now, not later, not in some spirit world, here and now, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of Christ could be fulfilled in us. Do you see that? It is God, friends, by sending Jesus, gives us the ability to obey him. This is why the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, And it is not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift from God, friends. You know, the law is meant to to show us our faults. It's there to show us our errors, friends. It's there to show us that we need a Savior, we need help. And we run to Jesus, friends, and we get washed by his blood. And something takes place in our lives, friend, that's really hard to explain. Jesus' mighty working power begins working in our lives, friends. The Bible says, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. When we see our need of Jesus, friends, when we run to Jesus, God begins working in our life. God sent his son to die for us, friends. So what is the old covenant and why did it fail? Because the Bible says there was two covenants right? So what is the old covenant and why did it fail? Look at what the Bible says. It says, behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will make a covenant with the house of Israel, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, which covenant they break. So the covenant isn't about the law, friends. The covenant is about the promises. God made a covenant with the children of Israel. They said all that the Lord has said we will do, but they didn't do it. They broke the covenant. It had nothing to do with the law, friends, because the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Something that's perfect. I don't think you change something that's perfect. You don't change something that's perfect. There was nothing wrong with God's law, friends. God's law is holy, just, and good, and God's law can bring life to the lifeless, friends. So the new covenant, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. The first law built on their promises, saying all that the Lord has said we will do. 
The second covenant built on God's promises, saying, I will put my law in their heart. I will take that same finger that etched those commandments on stone and etch them in your heart. Praise God that God's willing to do that today, friends, to take that law and put it in our hearts. Give us the ability to obey him. Praise God for the new covenant, friends. That's not built on our promises because our promises are faulty, friends, but God has promised to put his law in our hearts. Oh, this next question, friends, I have a hard time even putting it on the screen. I do. I have a hard time even reading this question right here, friends, but I've heard it so much. I hear, I hear it all the time canvassing. I even hear it from family members. Doesn't living under grace by faith make keeping God's law non-essential? If we're saved by grace and we're saved by faith, why do we have to keep the law? You know, and that just seems so, so ridiculous. Well, even when I hear it, even saying it, but it's a question that we need to address, friends, because we live in a world today where people think God's law is no longer binding, friends. Do we need to keep God's law? The Bible says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? What does the Bible say? God forbid. God forbid. The Bible says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? If Jesus comes into your life, and he cleanses your heart from sin, how are you going to continue in a life of sin? God is powerful, friends, and God can give you victory in your life. I want to tell you that I've learned it from experience, friends. I gave my heart to the Lord three years ago, friends, and I am amazed at the power of Jesus, the ability to change somebody's life. There was things in my heart, friends, that I never thought I could get rid of. Never. And I couldn't, friends. But I tell you, Jesus has done it. Taken it away. God is powerful, friends. And if we are dead in sin, how shall we live any longer in it? How? The Bible says, God forbid. How could we disrespect Jesus like that? You know, God has done so much for us. Why, why would we even want to think like that? You know, and I know maybe some people are watching right now or even maybe here that have, that have thought we don't have to keep God's law, friends. Well, we need to understand biblical truth, friends, that God's law is a blessing to us. It is meant to show us our condition so we can run to Jesus and have a complete heart change, have that law etched in our heart. Oh, and it feels so good when he takes that finger and just strikes your heart with it and you're changed. Praise God. So what motivates a person to obey God's law? Where does the motivation come from? I heard somebody say it. The Bible says, therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You know, if you really think about it, friends, you know, God, God wrote those Ten Commandments on two tables of stone for two reasons. If you look at the first four commandments, friends, they're built on our love for God. If we love God, we're not going to have other gods before God. If we love God, we're not going to bow down and worship images. If we love God, we're not going to take his name in vain. And the last six have to do with our love for fellow man. If I say I love my brother, I'm not going to sneak in his house and steal from him. If I say I love my brother, I'm not going to sleep with his wife when he's not home. If I love my brother, I'm not going to lie to him. God's law is built on love, friends. Love for God and love for our fellow men. Love is the fulfilling of the law, friends. And when we see what Jesus has done for us, friends, it's a, it's a great motivator. The Bible says this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Again, friends, looking at Jesus and seeing the things that Jesus has done for us, friends. Love is the motivator, friends. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Simple, isn't it? If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments, friends. The Bible says, can I be a true Christian without keeping his commandments? Can you be a true Christian without keeping God's commandments? We know that we need help. We know that we need Jesus working in our hearts. We know that, friends. We need God working in us, both the will and do of his good pleasure, friends.
But notice how clear the Bible is. The Bible says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we what? If we keep his commandments. That's how we know if we're Christians or not. That's how you know. The Bible says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a what? A liar. That's a strong statement, but you know what? It's true, and it's in the Bible, friends. He that says, I know God, I'm a Christian, but is breaking God's commandments, the Bible says he's a what? A liar. It's the truth. And God has called me to preach the truth, friends. If people want to say they're a Christian and they don't want to obey Jesus, the Bible calls him a liar. It says the truth is not in them. The Bible says that, friends. So, friends, what are some of the glorious rewards of keeping God's law? What are some of the glorious rewards? What does the Bible say happens when we obey God and when we keep his commandments? The Bible says, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. God is seeking to give us peace, friends, happiness. The Bible says that if we obey God, that we will find these things we're looking for, friends, peace and joy. The Bible says, he that keepeth the law, what is he? Happy is he if he keeps the law. Obeying God's law, friends, brings happiness. It brings, you see why the devil is attacking God's law? The devil is a liar, friends. And I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say he is a liar, a thief, wants to steal our joy, steal our happiness, wants to blind our eyes. Friend, the Bible says happy is he that keeps God's law. God wants us to be happy, friends. He wants us to have the peace that we need in our life. And the devil doesn't want us to, I really tell you what, friends, the devil is mad right now. He's not liking it, and I don't care. I don't care if he's mad. I know he's mad right now. Because God wants to expose all of, his, all of his deceptions. God wants us to see the beauty of keeping his law, friends. Obeying God brings peace in your life. And I wouldn't trade it for the world, friends. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Think about that. Do you get offended easy? Man, I know I always have. And sometimes i got to check myself even today. But it says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing, nothing shall offend them. Man, the peace that God is offering, friends, through obedience to his law. Praise God that he has given us his law. His commandments are beautiful, friends. And God wants to write them on our hearts. Do you know that? God doesn't want to etch them in stone, friends. He wants to write his commandments on the tables of our heart and give us great peace, give us the happiness that the world can't offer. Can't do it, friends. And you want to know how you get it, friends? How you can have God just etch that law right in your hearts, friends? It's so simple. It's actually the easiest thing that you could ever do. You want to know how? The Bible says in John 3, 16, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, by believing in God, It's how our lives can be changed. By believing in Jesus, friends, it's how that law that was etched on stone can be etched on our hearts, friends. It's so simple. God sent Jesus. He sent his only son, friends, to die for us. And it says, what does it say right there? Whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I I want you to think about that for a minute. Just for one moment, eternity is what God is offering us today, friends everlasting life and it says all you have to do is believe believe that i've sent my son believe that jesus has condemned sin in the flesh believe in the son of god friends and god can write that law on the tablets of your heart friends do you believe that 
All you have to do is believe, and Jesus can write it in your hearts. I was um, 12 years old. Um, I didn't know anything about Jesus, and I began listening to gangster rap music and wanting to be the tough guy on the block. 12 years old. And I remember I had my friend over to my house one day, and we seen some kid, young kid, walking down the street. And I thought, okay, this is my time to look tough. I'm going to teach my friend how tough I really am. And so we ran outside, and I ran up to this little kid. He was like this tall. And I got in his face, and I started cursing at him calling him all types of derogatory names, all in his face. And I remember this kid said, Josh, please stop. I'm sorry. And I cursed at him, and I cursed at him, and I got in his face and calling him all these drugs, and all he kept saying was, Josh, I'm sorry. Please stop. And it didn't enter to my mind, how does this guy know my name? Why is he calling me my name? And after I was done, after I felt like I, after I felt accomplished, like I had done something, 
I went in the house, and as I went in the house, all of a sudden, I remembered. I remembered who he was. He was my childhood friend from like five years before. His name was Omar. He was my friend. And I remember, friends, I felt there was a guilt and a shame that came over me like I've never felt in my life. I was 12 years old. And I was just weighed down with this horrible guilt, horrible shame, so embarrassed, could not believe what I had just done. I began crying. I went and got the phone book. All I remember was his name was Omar. I went and got in the phone book and looked up every person named Omar. I started calling them, telling them who I was, wanting to know if this was the Omar I knew. And it wasn't. I was felt so bad. I've never felt something like that in my life, friends, because I had violated God's law, and I didn't know it. I didn't understand God's law. I didn't know that this law that he wanted to write in our, write in our hearts keeps us from having to experience that guilt and that shame. You know, that's what God's law is for, friends. It is to keep us guarded so that we don't have to experience guilt and shame and embarrassment. God's law, friends, is a blessing to us. You know, I'm so thankful that today, friends, Jesus has lifted that guy. I never got to see Omar again. I never saw him again. But I know God has forgiven me. And I pray Omar, even if he's watching now, that he will forgive me too. But that's what God is desiring for us to, to do for us, for him to guard us so that we don't have to have that guilt and shame. You know, maybe there's somebody watching right here or somebody here, maybe that's suffered, maybe they've committed adultery, cheated on their spouse, weighed down with the guilt and shame of cheating on their spouse. Maybe they're suffering from addiction. Maybe they're weighed down with the guilt and the shame from destroying their whole family. God can put that law into your heart. He can do it even tonight, friends, so you don't have to experience the guilt and shame of a life of sin. God can do something mighty, friends, and that's what God wants to do for us tonight, friends. And he's asking you today, friends, will you allow me to etch that law in your heart? Will you let him etch that law so you don't have to experience the guilt and the shame of breaking his law? Would you like to accept Jesus' invitation and allow him to etch the law in your heart? Would you like to say yes to Jesus? Would you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful, Lord for your commandments, Lord. We're so thankful, Father, that we can look at your law and see the problem with our life, to see where our errors are coming from, to know that it's from breaking your law. Oh, Father, thank you for your commandments, Lord, where we can see our faults and run to Jesus. And thank you for giving your Son who condemns sin in the flesh. Thank you, Lord. And Father, tonight we want to ask that that finger that etched that law in stone would please touch our hearts and put those laws in our hearts. And Father, we thank you so much for the hope that we have in Jesus, and we pray all this in his name. Amen. All right, thank you, everybody. So please be back Wednesday for another message um, entitled, The Rest of Your Life. And yeah, you don't want to miss that. Mark Kennedy will be speaking. We are so pleased that you could join us for this special event here at Wachita Hills Academy and College. If you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, you can go ahead and like, share, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to support making programs such as these, you can find donation information in the description below. Thank you so much again for joining us, and may God richly bless you.